I know her as a leader in uh, the analysis of how much climate change is coming out of the cities of California and where are they coming from. And she has the most coherent statements I've heard about on the impact of natural gas leaks. Hello, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Um, so first of all, thank you, Sean and Robert. Um, Robert, I'm really glad to hear that you finally got your gas line capped and went zero carbon. Um, and I'm also glad to hear Sean and Robert both taking on some of the safety issues um, around pipelines, just kind of touching on them a bit. Um, I'd love to just point out really quickly that I do have a citation at the end of my slide that looks at uh, vulnerabilities to natural gas pipelines to sea level rise and flooding in areas that we're going to start to get more uh, precipitation falling as rain instead of snow. Um, so that's something that if you guys want to touch on the safety aspects, definitely check out that citation later. Um, so I'm going to talk today just about more of kind of the climactic and science background into why it's so important right now to significantly reduce emissions from natural gas. Um, and as you guys know, I'm sure natural gas is composed primarily of methane, and that's known as a short-lived climate pollutant. Um, and the more I research this topic, the more I kind of understand that the immediate, immediate importance of mitigating methane and other short-lived climate pollutants, um, which you guys as practitioners of z &E have a huge role in when it comes to natural gas specifically, um, it will have a huge impact on the temperature of the climate, climate um, pretty quickly. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. <laughs> I work um, yeah, with local governments in California doing sustainability analytics, so primarily greenhouse gas mitigation, quantification, and then also a master's candidate at Scripps um, for climate science and policy, so kind of digging more into the science. Um, I recently had a project with the cities of Oakland and San Francisco and later on cities all over North America to look at primarily just methane leaks from natural gas distribution pipelines um, within city boundaries. There was this really interesting project that stemmed out of Boston when um, a scientist just decided to walk the streets um, of his neighborhood with a methane detector and ended up found, finding just thousands of leaks all across the city, um, these huge areas of um, high concentration of methane and linked it back to the natural gas system by a series of um, analyses that I don't need to get into. Um, but a lot of different kind of grassroots projects stemmed off of that um, just to kind of quantify how much these pipelines are leaking. Um, and so we were interested in seeing, you know, if cities want to create a policy where you electrify buildings because this could be such a big issue, um, what kind of science can you use to back that up when you know you're going to get a lot of pushback from a lot of different stakeholders in the area? Um, and as we started researching this project, we kind of expanded and expanded and expanded because the climate impacts when you go all the way back to fracking or extraction um, are really profound from this one fuel. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm gonna be talking to you guys about today. So if you go to the next slide, um, there's no better way to start any sort of climate science presentation than uh, with the past 800,000 years of carbon dioxide data. Um, so as you can see here, we our earth system goes in and out of ice ages and sub subsequent melting. And um, throughout you know the last 800,000 years, we've oscillated pretty much between the bounds of 180 and 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, um, you can see at that zero marker, we've shot up to about uh, 409 parts per million. That reading was taken a couple days ago from Scripps. Um, so that's a pretty significant factor greater than just that oscillation in between ice ages and melting. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, CO2 concentrations and global mean temperatures. This one shows Antarctic temperature. So um, there's a bit of an actual uh, temperature um, 
increase there in the Antarctic region, but uh, the correlation is the same with global mean temperatures. Um, so we can see, of course, you guys know this, going up to 400 is going to put the Earth system into a bit of a shock. Um, so on the next slide, um, yeah, let's see. So I, I'm kind of showing here how our temperatures have increased. And of course, it doesn't look like that spike when we look at the last 800,000 years. Um, but we are increasing pretty steadily and um, there's evidence to show we're starting to accelerate at this point. Um, the IPCC has estimated that we will be in a temperature range um, by 2035 of 1.2 to 1.6 degrees Celsius above um, the 1961-ish climatological mean, so our historical levels. Um, and just kind of gauging off those last two slides, our Earth system oscillates between these melting and ice periods um, with the, its own built-in feedback processes. Um, so there's a lot of different scientists that are talking about different climate accelerators um, that can kind of happen through these feedback processes. And I point out one um, these are all areas of scientific contention right now, but, um, you know, they're important to point out because we are kind of uh, experimenting <laughs> with the earth right now. Um, so one of them is this initiation of the release of Arctic methane. Um, this would have such a uh, thermal momentum that regardless of any sort of temperatures in the future, it would just not stop emitting um, and be irreversible on human time scales, bring temperatures way above anything that's potentially survivable with humidity. Um, so of course, right now, if you go to the next slide, and sorry, that we're talking about 2035. So we have this very big goal right now. Um, and it's interesting to me that this isn't stressed enough uh, generally, but we wanna level off warming. So actual temperature increase within the next uh, you know, less than 20 years as to buy time for deeper decarbonization efforts with carbon dioxide for the longer term climate stability. So of course we want our earth to reach equilibrium and be stable for a long time, but right now we're kind of in this make or break period where we need to level off temperatures. So that's our goal. I'm going to try to tell you a little bit of how I think we can reach this goal within this presentation. Um, so if you go to the next slide, how do we do this? Um, there's actually a ton of information on this right now um, on short-lived climate pollution, pollution reduction, but kind of the original study that I always go back to is the Schindel et al. study that's cited in the back. Um, and if you kind of look at that 2035 range, we can see that um, if we only look at carbon dioxide measures, will definitely surpass the 1.5 degree limit um, and head quickly for, towards the two degree limit. So 2035, there's that little blue dotted line. So it's a little bit hard to see, but tried to point it out for you guys. Um, and the reason that is, is because carbon dioxide has a lifespan of 100 years. So it takes decades for us to really see an actual cooling effect from any reductions of that pollutant. Um, but on the other side, there's these short-lived climate pollutants that include methane, black carbon, and hydrofluorocarbons, which are um, much more potent than carbon dioxide, uh, meaning that they warm, they increase the temperature of the globe more efficiently than carbon dioxide. Um, however, they only last in the atmosphere for um, some of them for weeks, methane is about 20 years or so, um, a bit less depending on how you want to calculate that. Um, let's see, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so this one I just kind of wanted to show what the lifespans and warming effects shows for these different pollutants. So here, of course, I'm focusing on methane since that's what's in natural gas. Um, and it's the highest temperature effect within about 20 years of being emitted. It can react in the atmosphere that this chart doesn't really show with other compounds to form carbon dioxide. So after 20 years, it doesn't necessarily disappear. Um, 
But regardless, if we keep it out of the atmosphere, there will be a, a pretty significant temperature change reduction uh, within the short term. Uh, I also want, May sorry? I, I, had a, I had a question. Yeah. Um, if you have, a, what exactly is the lifespan of natural gas in the atmosphere so far as when it turns into something else? Because I see these 20 year increments, but I know that you've spoken before that it might be 12 years or 15 years, or can you speak a little on that? Sure, yeah, so it depends on what it reacts with in the atmosphere. So it's typically reacted with this um, hydroxyl uh, compound, OH. And um, so that, it would be a 12 year lifespan, but that's a little bit of a tricky issue because we have been reducing that in the atmosphere. So it's been lasting a bit longer. Um, so the lifetime does change a bit, but typically people go with 12 years. Um, this chart, of course, shows that I think what it's trying to show is its reaction time depending on what it's reacting with in the atmosphere. So it can last up to 20, but it kind of starts to dip down after that 12 year range. Does that make sense? Sorry, I had to unmute myself and I was just nodding going, yes, thank you. <laughs> Got it. No worries. Um, okay, so this uh, table on the right here, um, I just wanted to point out is how we've gauged um, the global warming potential. So how we compare different climate pollutants to carbon dioxide. Um, and in the 90s, we thought, you know, over 20 years. Um, this, is, Sean, is a little bit to your point. I'm not sure why we use 20 years through the IPCC. It's um, they actually mentioned that there's no real reason for using 20 years. We could use 12 or 10 or 5 or whatever, but this is just the increment that they use um, to kind of average out what the impacts are over a designated amount of time. So um, the impact of, natural of methane and natural gas over 12 years would be even higher than this GWP over 12 20, um, but this is what the IPCC gives us to work with. So the 20 years kind of the closest that we want to use, I guess. And then if I could ask one more question, it, the, the impact of it being say a 12 year lifespan, if we look at the 2020 building code of California, which still allows gas to be installed, I hope that changes in the next code, but the 12 year starting in 2020, the natural gas fades out in 2032, 2033. Um, and that is apparently this important period of time in which we're trying to get rid of the impact of natural gas in order to lower temperatures. It, am I right in thinking that this is a strategic move that we should be eliminating natural gas right now, kind of? Yes, yes, you are correct in that. Unless we can invent a methane vacuum for the atmosphere, I think it would be very strategic to um, electrify in the 2020 building code. Thank you, continue <laughs> on. <laughs> no worries. Um, Okay, so since the 90s, we've thought it was 63 times more potent than CO2. At this point, we're thinking it's about 96 times more potent than CO2. Um, in our inventories nationally, statewide, local, in our cap and trade system, everything averages the effect of methane over 100 years. So this little hump now dies down to a very you know, flat average closer to CO2. So that's where most people are still using the AR4 value of 25 times more potent than CO2. Um, so I just wanted to show you guys, the next couple of slides are going to show um, what our, I think I'm using national for all of these, but what our national inventories look like right now, how we're kind of gauging the difference of methane and carbon dioxide and how we're kind of, um, Mm, our inventories are kind of looking like there's some sort of bias to making methane not as big of a deal as it potentially is on a shorter time frame, as well as um, just with uh, miscalculation. So this first slide um, shows how methane is documented in the inventory using that 100 year average of its potency. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so the green is methane and then it, it's broken down by gas, you can see. Um, on the next slide, it would show what our inventory would look like if we estimated the 20-year uh, global warming potential for methane. 
So 25% increase. I'm actually using the 82% value instead of 96 um, because I hadn't seen that last study when I uh, went through and did this report. Um, but so it's likely even higher than that. And then if you go to the next slide, um, there is scientific evidence that the we are actually emitting a lot more methane than we are currently showing for in our inventory. So um, there's been a lot of different air campaigns where we bring instrumented um, aircraft into the atmosphere and um, measure for methane. And so just in the last, you know, since 2004, we've seen this increasing discrepancy in between inventories in the atmosphere. Um, so if you throw that discrepancy onto the inventories, the next slide will show you what the inventory would actually look like, methane versus carbon dioxide. So now we're kind of seeing it looks very much like an equal issue within these two um, gases. Uh, so in the next slide, there's been, you know, contention. I've sat in a lot of meetings with um, natural gas uh, utilities and they always say, oh no, you know, this isn't us, this is definitely cows. So I decided to run a um, little analysis on how has our production values changed uh, since 2004 just to see why is this discrepancy happening? Is there really a huge bump in livestock production and dairies and or um, landfill emissions? Or could this be likely more of a natural gas production problem? Um, and of course, I mean, it's likely an issue of all of them combined, but natural gas production um, most closely resembles this discrepancy. Um, and, you know, this has also been at a time where natural gas production and exploration of shale gas, um, so fracking, became a lot more popular. And just to note, in California specifically as well, um, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has determined methane emissions are likely 1.3 to 2.9 times higher than the carbon inventory. So this isn't just um, a national issue. This is also very much underrepresented in California as well. Um, so I think the next slide. Yeah, so um, don't want to take up too much time on this, but this is basically just a review of research on methane leakage throughout the life cycle of the natural gas system. So from extraction to end use. Um, the EPA right now estimates there's a 1.4% leak rate within their inventories. Um, and there's a few studies, which I believe I cite at the end, that if there's a 1% leakage of methane from natural gas, the fuel has the same global warming effect as using coal as the fuel source. Um, yeah, some people like to use 2%, but it has to do with sulfates and coal. So there's uh, little things, but between one and 2%, depending on what study you wanna use, um, it's worse than coal. So most other studies, this is obviously at the very low end of the estimation. Most other studies have gauged even up to 12% leak rate um, when looking just at shale production, but at all production types, um, you know, up to 7% leak rate. And if we were to believe the EPA's estimate, even that 1.4% leak rate is equal to 72 Aliso Canyon disasters annually. If you remember the um, large disaster in California a couple years ago. Um, so then the next slide, this is a cool um, campaign that went on Google Acloma, which is a, uh, um, air quality sensor company and uh, the Environmental Defense Fund teamed up, teamed up and drove these air quality sensors around city streets on the Google streetcars to measure um, where all these leaks are in city distribution pipelines. Um, and some cities like Boston, which is on the right there, had 
thousands of leaks, uh, multiple per mile. They have older pipelines, whereas places like Pasadena on the left had a lot less, but still a significant number of leaks within city boundaries. And, you know, these are residential areas, there's health issues, all that kind of stuff. Um, in California, Senate Bill 1371 required natural gas utilities to show the number of leaks that they have and um, general location. I think they only went as deep as which county they're in, unfortunately. Um, but we did get the number of leaks that each of them um, know about. They did use an emissions factor for the actual um, leak uh, flow of the leak which we know that they actually document the flow for safety reasons, um, but they use an emission factor, which is biased on the low side. Um, but we were able to get a number of leaks and it's in the you know tens of thousands just in California. Um, so in the next slide, um, what can we do about this? So there is, Sorry, trying to read all these questions. I think I'll have to get to them right after this. But um, there's two kind of schools of thought about this. One, which California is looking into pilot projects for, is we capture methane from landfills, dairies, biological sources, and pump it into our existing natural gas pipeline system um, as this quote unquote renewable natural gas. Um, and it's kind of this kill two birds with one stone type idea, which may not necessarily be a bad idea, um, except that the pipeline system is significantly affected and vulnerable to sea level rise and these, you know, landslides, increased precipitation events, stuff like that. And the repair and replacement of these system co systems cost between 0.6 and $8.9 million per mile, depending on uh, the pipeline type and size and uh, congestion of the area that you're replacing it in. Um, and there was a bill in California to SB 1441 to try to protect ratepayers from having to pay for those replacements and that unfortunately died. But the other way that I think is, you know, the best way to go about this is to, of course, electrify the building stock. And there's plenty of studies right out right now about how do we reach this two degree Paris goal. Um, and pretty much the only way is to electrify everything and bring it on to renewables. Uh, so this is the direction we're heading anyways. Um, so it makes the most sense to go towards that now. I saw you guys had a couple of talks on heat pump water heaters. So I wanted to point out a study by Hong and Howarth, which is in uh, my citation slide, that says if we um, changed out all water heaters to heat pumps, we would see a reduction of 2.7% of the national greenhouse gas inventory. So the whole nation's greenhouse gas emissions would reduce by almost 3%, which is hugely significant um, when we're talking about the national scale and something that's very doable. <clears throat> and then, you know, the other things that California specifically has to do is we need to eliminate code barriers um, to switching out to natural gas. So there's a few kind of software limitations and calculations that sort of bias towards using natural gas within Title 24. And, you know, also this 2020 ZNE policy that is ZNE for electricity instead of um, all carbon sources. So those are some things that I think we should think about. And sorry, that took a little bit of time. So I have three minutes for questions. Well, Naomi, thank you. It was fantastic first. Yay, Naomi. <laughs> Thanks. Email uh, me for additional questions, too. I'm totally open to that. So I think one of the, the first ones, uh, Naomi, can you discuss how the CARB accounts for fugitive methane leakage in its GHG inventory? So California Air Resources Board. She suspects that the GHG wedges for the sectors of the economy, Rachel, I mean, uh, is just carbon and doesn't include leakage. Understanding whether or not this leakage is accounted for by CARB would help their advocacy to get more attention to GHGs and buildings. So can you talk to about CARB? Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, so actually part of this project that I've done, which um, it's not being uh, able, 
published right now because utilities are going back and saying they need five years to look at different data sources that they gave us. Um, but CARB was a big part of it and they went around to all these distribution lines, dug them up, took real time um, leakage data because th this is a huge unknown for CARB right now. They're using emission factors from the oil and gas industry given to them in the 90s that doesn't really um, uh, deal with any sort of equipment upgrades or um, aging infrastructure and of course could potentially be biased because it's from the oil and gas industry. Um, so they went through and did a study to actually measure the leak rates from transmission and distribution lines and that also got pulled um, last year or the year before by the oil by PG&E, SDG&E, um, those sources to have five years to over to review what the actual leak rates that they measured are. Um, so yeah, I mean, five in, in the five, sorry? I'm just outraged. Five <laughs> years for them to tell us how much leakage we have here. I mean, note that that's two code cycles in terms of PG&E also funds code changes, right? And so yeah. that can tell us how bad the problem is for five years. How do we end run that nonsense? Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty outraged about it, too. Um, I mean, it, it's even worse because, you know, CAR was the entity taking this data and oil and gas companies or these utilities could already lead them to the leaks and kind of bias the study anyways. And I did see the results of that study and it was incredible. Like we had leakage rates that were far beyond the national average uh, from these 90 studies. Um, and California is supposed to be, you know, the best state. We're not supposed to have nearly as much leakage as the, nat the national average. Um, and so, of course, you know, it got pulled for one reason or another. But um, yeah, I mean, there's reason to think there was malicious intent there, kind of. <laughs> they didn't want it publicized, but. Um, yeah, this goes on and on. I, so. I think that Rachel Golden and you should try to work together. Um, if you don't have each other's email addresses yet, we'll follow up on that. Uh, there is one other question. Um, Dave Jaber, oh, there's a few other, but the, the question is, can you say more about the leakage in extraction and combustion versus distribution? Because if there's more in distribution, you can argue for use in power plants, but it says if more is the latter, you can argue for use in power plants, just not distribution out of out to homes, where the vast amount of piping and leakage potential must be, I'd think. So he's, he's sort of trying to speculate as to where do the leaks really exist and would it favor using gas still in power plants versus homes, uh, depending upon what your knowledge of leaks are. Right. The majority of leaks are from extraction um, and distribution to the production site. Um, so that's where it's highly unregulated and there's less of a safety issue because they're in more remote places. Um, big leaks do get fixed on the distribution side because there is extreme danger there um, and they're, um, you know, they keep, they keep pretty good track of them. They don't have incentive to close all of these leaks, only the ones that are kind of about to blow up. Um, but the majority of the leak is on the extraction side. Um, and I could probably, if whoever asked that question emails me, I can probably give them a little snippet from the report that looks at that. The person is David Jaber. And, uh, <laughs> oh good, uh, David, you could probably put your email address in the chat line and that would facilitate this. Um, uh, we're trying to bring up Jonathan Moscatello. He's here. Oh, he's here, oh good. Um, oh, Jonathan, there you are. So we're going to unmute you. And Naomi, uh, if you don't mind, you can look at the, the chat that goes to all panelists and mm -hmm. you might take note of, you know, who said what and, and try to get back to them. And I'll try to do the same thing for you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Naomi.